Amen. What a great God we serve. Grab your Bibles this morning. Amen. Just in the spirit of just worship, we're going to go to the Word. Go to the book of James. We've been in James. We're going to wrap that up this morning and just share James chapter 5. I just want just a few things I want to share with you. Um, some of what we did last week, but some of revisiting this passage just to hear um, more from God so that God could just move and have his way. Thank you guys. We're good. Thank you all. Amen. Bless the name of the Lord. If you're in James chapter 5, say amen. Amen. And let me encourage you, if you have been um, missing the series, I want to encourage you to make sure you go to our um, online, our website, or our YouTube channel, um, podcast, download the pad, podcast, do whatever you need to do to get caught up. We've been talking so much about the importance of prayer and the fact that prayer changes things. And by way of practicum, here's what we've been doing. Every Wednesday, um, 6.30 to 7.30, we come in here, we cry out to God, and we pray to God. So I want to encourage you all to make sure you take a time on Wednesdays to come. This past Wednesday, I must admit that God just really moved in our midst, and God just really had his way in our place. Amen? So I want to invite you all just to be a part of that so that God could move and be God in our midst. James chapter 5, let me read um, verses 13 through 18 in its entirety. And then um, I just want to get to just a few things that I did not get a chance to do last week. So if this is your first Sunday or you had missed the previous Sunday, the message may sound funny to you because I'm just going to jump in the middle of some of the things that I'm saying um, just to kind of make sure I drive these points home to our congregation so we can get to a place of prayer. Here's what it says in verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. If anyone... Among, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, it says in verse 16, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Then by way of illustration, <clears throat> verse 17 says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore forth its fruit. I need you all to do me a favor. How many of you in here really believe in the power of prayer? I mean, sure enough, believe, sure enough, sure enough, amen, sure enough, believe in the power of prayer. I, 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 I said this last week, and I'll say it again, so I might sound like a broken record or like I'm repeating myself, and I am. I'm crazy enough to believe that if the people of God can ever get to the place where we cry out to God in prayer, that there's really nothing we cannot do as it relates to a corporate body of believers. I want y'all to hear me say that. Scripture is clear where it says Jesus was speaking to his disciples and the people. If you have faith like the size of a grain of mustard seed, you can say to the mountains, move and go into the sea, and it has to do it, right? Then, then when we read what we've been studying, I, I, I understand that we still serve a miracle-working God. We still serve a God that can heal the sick, a God that can raise the dead, a God that can do the miraculous. And what I'm learning about God is that there's no mountain that he can't climb over. There's no valley too low that he can't get in. And I want you all to hear me say that. There is no problem, situation, or circumstance that God is not powerful enough to access and to handle. My question for us as a body of believers, if we know that and we believe that, why don't we trust God like that to do the impossible? Here's what I'm learning. The problem more times than often is not God, it's us. Right? And, and, and our faith level. So let me explain faith level so you don't think I'm saying some weird stuff. Meaning... That if we say we trust and we believe God can, we need to walk like he can. Does that make sense? We need to walk like he can. And my goal in this series, that we, as we've been talking about the fact that prayer changes things, is that my goal is that this house really becomes a house of prayer, really becomes a place of prayer, really 
a, a place where we learn to give God what's rightfully his and worship him the way he ought to be worshipped. So I just want to walk through just a few things um, that I didn't get a chance to talk about last week as we kind of go through this so we can kind of hear what God is saying. And here's the thing that we said, first of all, based on verse 13, right? Is that the Christians should respond in all situations of life with prayer. And I want y'all to hear me say that. There, there ought not be a place where we find ourselves as believers in Christ that we're going through things and our first response is not consultation with God. Come on, are you with me? It doesn't matter what the crisis is. It doesn't matter what the situation. It doesn't matter what the storm or stronghold is. I want us to get to the place where whenever we find ourselves in any predicament, the very first thing we do is we consult with God, not the flesh. Are you hearing me? Okay. Now, here's the depth of consulting with God. When we consult with him, give him room to respond. Don't just get up and do. And then when he speaks, do what he says do. Oh, come on, talk to me. And a lot of times what he says do, Pastor Derek, it won't feel good to us because it'll go against the flesh, but we must get to that place, right? So repeat after me. Say, trust God in every situation. Now, here's where I want to pick up a little because I didn't do this much last week. So here's the second thing I want us to get is that when it comes to us and sickness, and I'm talking with some intentional things that I'm going to flesh out in a little while, uh, I, grace me as we talk about this, right? So look at verse 13 and look at 14. If any of you is suffering, let him pray. If he's cheerful, let him sing praise. If anyone among you is sick, let him call, look at this now, for the elders of the church and let them pray over him or her anointing him or her with oil in the name of the Lord. Let me keep going. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. I will keep going. If he had committed sins, it will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed because the effective prayer of the righteous is powerful while it is working. So a couple of things that I want us to kind of look through the text, and I want to walk through this real quick. And I need to kind of rehash this, because we had a great conversation Wednesday as we were talking about this, and I want to be a little clear, and I want you all to hear my heart as it relates to scriptures, because I think that the God's word, well, I know, let me say think, I know God's word is true, and my prayer as a ministry that we learn to access God's word and walk it out. So here's a couple of things that I want you to relate to as, as it num relates to number two. So when the text says, if anyone is sick, I, don't, I, I want you all to go with me here for a little while. And, and let me give you this caveat, right? I am not a, a prosperity teacher or I am not a faith-only teacher. I, I teach the Bible. And so when the Bible says something, I have to deal with the truth of the Bible. Okay? I have to deal with the truth of the Bible. So here's what I want you to hear as we kind of walk through this, um, and grace me as we kind of walk through this for a little while. Verse 14 said, if anyone among you is sick, come on, say sick. sick. Say it again, say sick. sick. Now, here's the richness of what I want you all to understand about this text. That word sick that's being used there is not talking about some spiritual ailment or illness. It is talking about a physical sickness. Let's get that out of the way, okay? So go home, do your work, do your research, do whatever you need to do. So when James says, if anyone is sick, here's what James is literally saying to the new community of believers. Now, hear this. He is not saying don't go to the doctor. He's not saying don't seek medical professional help. He's not saying any of that. But what he is saying along the way, don't leave God out of the equation. He is saying that, okay? Now, now, let me go here, people. I want you all to hear me. I got to lay this out. So when he's saying sick, though he is speaking to the body of believers, what James is saying is not solely restricted only to Christians. I walk this out carefully, okay? I, wa I want you all to hear me say, let me, let me, let me, we're going to pick this up Wednesday. So in other words... It, in the church, in the church, I think it's safe to say, in the church, there was both saved and unsaved people. 
They were both mature and immature Christians in the church. Does that make sense? Right? And so here's what he's saying. If within our congregation there is a physical illness or a physical ailment, here's what I want you to do. Right? He gives the instruction of what they want to do. Now, the reason I want to deal with the physicality of the nature of this sickness, because I need you to hear me say that God can still open blinded eyes. I need you to hear me say that. I I need you to hear me say that God can still make the lame walk. I I need you to hear me say that God can still heal from cancer. Come on. I I need you to hear me say that God can still heal from addiction, from ailment. And, and, And matter of fact, let me put it this way. There's no problem on the face of the earth that God can say, man, I hadn't thought about that one. Right? So within that framework, here's how James pulls that together. If anybody within the congregation has an issue, here's a process that I want to outline before you. And then he says this crazy thing. He says this, call the elders of the church and let them pray over you. Uh, Now, this is where I got to get serious. The second thing says to call the elders of the congregation. Which seems to imply, that second point, that the elders within that New Testament church held a specific role within the body. These weren't people that just did, excuse the grammar, whatsoever they wanted to do, whensoever they want to do it, howsoever they want to do it, and then come to church and fake the funk. These people that he's speaking about here were people that were sold out to God. And these were people that had an expectation that if they accessed God, God would respond on their behalf because they had it like that with him. Oh my gosh, I need to go here with you. Let let, let me, because you see what's happened is that we don't understand what James is saying and we've downplayed the concept of eldership so much that in today's church, everybody wants to be an elder and they don't understand what they're asking for. We don't get the depths of it, right? Because here's what James is saying. they call the elders is because when you go to them, they're putting their name, their relationship, their walk, their access to God on the line. They're going to intercede on, I wish I had somebody in here, on your behalf to make sure that God does what God said he's going to do. And let me get ahead of myself. If you look at the text, notice the confidence within which James says the elders are going to do what he said. God will. That's what he said, God will. So these, these are men and women that had access. They were gifted. They were called. Are you hearing me? So they were committed. They were in deep. Matter of fact, nothing took priority over their call. Think about it. Let me go here. Eldership didn't just begin in the book of James. If you go way back to the Old Testament, and we'll talk about this Wednesday, it was a leadership principle that God had in place with his congregation from day one, right? Matter of fact, if you look at the nation of Israel, matter of fact, when God called Moses, here's what he said to him. Go to the elders, you get it? And here's the term, and the elders will confirm that I have spoken to you. So here's what this looks like in the Old Testament. The same God that spoke to Moses was already speaking to the elders. Right? Come come on. I mean, right? And then if you look at the Israelites when they left um, left Egypt and they were walking and going to Canaan, the eldership played a critical role. In other words, the eldership were governance. The eldership, listen to this, was the voice of God to the people because the Holy Spirit did not yet reside within individuals. Remember with me when, 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 um, when, God, when Jethro in Exodus 18 encountered Moses, here's what Moses was doing. Moses was leading the people all by himself. 
all hundreds of thousands, if not millions of them. And then here's what um, Jethro says to Moses. Hey, Moses, appoint leaders over hundreds and leaders over thousands and leaders over ten. Guess who Jethro was referring to him? Don't you have an eldership? That the people can access? Let me go here. That those individuals can go to God on behalf of the people? You guys are walking with me, right? And then, and then you look at judges, right? Even in the judges, when the people were messed up, this is the pre-monarchy era, meaning before kings were on the scene, before the king shows up, who do you think were leading the people of Israel? It's the elders. They were doing all of that, right? And then you get over all to the New Testament, the same concept transfers, the same concept sets over, the same concept takes place. These elders, even though pre-Christ some had a different framework on how things worked and occurred, but they played a critical role in the lives of the people because of their relationship with God. So get this, eldership in the Bible was not so much about a position than it was about ministry. When I responded to the call, I'm saying I'm going to God on behalf of. I'm an advocate. You kind of get what I'm saying. Matter of fact, you'll see, let me, let me go here first. Go to Titus. Let me, let me go to Titus 5, then we'll back up to Timothy. Y'all go here real quick. Come on. Go here real quick. I want y'all to see this. Um, Titus. Go to, go to Titus. I want us to look to see this and kind of get a feel of, of what that is saying so we can hear and, and read this. I want, I want y'all to see this. Amen. Okay, Timothy, Titus, let's get there. I want y'all to see it. And Titus, if if you're getting lost and you're in Revelation, you're too far. I just backed up a little bit, okay? Look at, yeah, right behind Timothy. And look at chapter 1, verse 5. Let me give you the importance of this. Let me describe these individuals and say what I'm going to say. You guys are there? Look at verse 5. This was Paul's church planting model. Say amen if you're there. He says, this is why I left you, speaking to Titus, in Crete, so that you might put um, what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And look at what he says in verse 6. If anyone is above what? Reproach the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer or an elder or presbyters, as God's, what's the word? As God's what? I need everybody to say, as God's what? You know what a steward is? A steward is a manager of somebody else's property. As God's stewards of his people on the earth, They must be above reproach, must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright. What's that? Holy. And what's the word? You guys know what discipline mean? Here, let, let me help you with discipline. If I'm truly disciplined, it's not so much that I have my life in order, But what discipline means from a biblical perspective, God is always first uncompromisingly. You guys all right? They must be disciplined. You kind of get that? And they must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that they may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to do what? Rebuke those who do what? And read verse 10 when you get home because there's a problem in the world, okay? Back up to Timothy. Let me give you this one real quick. Um, what's that? First Timothy, First Timothy 3. Uh, let me just show you this, 1, 7. Let me give you the same thing in a different, in a different word. First, first Timothy 3. And you see why Paul is saying what Paul is saying. I mean, James is saying what James is saying. I'm sorry. Okay, verse 3, verse 1. Say amen if you're there. Here's, here's Paul now saying the same thing to his son Timothy, to his son in ministry Timothy. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, elder, presbyters, he desires a noble task. Because an overseer must be same word, above reproach, same instrument, uh, the husband of one wife or one spouse, sober-minded, um, self-controlled, respectable, 
hospitable. What's this other one? Why is that important? Because you've got to explain the truths of the word of God to individual, right? Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. They must manage their own household well with all dignity, keeping the children, his or her children, what? Submissive. And I like this verse. For if someone does not know how to manage their own household well, how will he care for God's church? This is deep. I don't want to jump over this so fast. I'm an elder, but my life is jacked up. Who am I going to take to God and I can't take myself? I'm an elder, but my finances are not in order. Who am I going to take to God? I'm an elder, and the community sees me as a mess. Who am I? You kind of get this, guys? Come on, church, is this making sense? Because these individuals fit this bill and they fit this character trait. I'm an elder, but my home is a mess. Who am I going to pray for? Think about it, right? Because here, now, now we're going to go back to James in a little while because I want you all to see this. It, it's that the, what's, what's being connoted is these individuals, here's a harsh word, were God representatives in the earth realm. Now, don't get this twisted. It's not that you and I don't have the Spirit of God and we don't have access to God. We do have the Spirit of God. And the priesthood right of the believer says that everyone with the Spirit of God in them have access to God. The goal of eldership is to help coach you in your relationship to God. So like how they can access God, you too can access him. Come on, is this making sense? Come on, y'all say amen. Y'all quiet. I want us to get this, I want us to get this, I want us to get this. Because here's what's got to happen. If the church is going to be strong and the church is going to become what God wants it to be, the elders ought to be living their life in such a way that the church people trust them so they can bring their stuff to them. Here's what's happening. The congregation is peeping the eldership out. And they don't see God, so they don't comfortable bringing stuff. You see the problem? Come on, church. So go back to James. Go back to James. Go back to James. I want us to get there because I don't want us to miss this. And I'm going to move. This is, this is why I'm saying, um, where is it, James? Uh, very, very important that we not miss this. So he says, if you're sick, call the elders of the church and let them pray over, right? Here's a couple of things that I showed you last week and I'm almost done with this. Is that the elders are called to the sick people, Right? And, and this is why, this is very, very important. The elders do all their praying, all the praying, not the sick person. Don't miss that in the text because that's important. If, 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 if my life, if I'm praying to God and God can't seem to fix my thing as an elder, guess what's going to happen? When you come to me for me to pray over you, if God can't do me, I'm wishy-washy on whether he can do you. <laughs> Does this make sense, right? So when the elders show up, right, they should have such a bio sketch or such a, a, what's the word I'm looking for? A resume of the faithfulness of God. Now, now you'll get this in the Old Testament. Whenever God did something miraculous, here's what the prophet or the saint would do. They would build an altar as a reminder of what God did. So here's what the Old Testament eldership looked like. When they saw you in catastrophe and they show up, hey man, the same God who brought us out of Egypt can bring you out. Hey man, the same God that parted the Red Sea can fix that in your life. Hey man, the same God that opened the Jordan can fix that. The same God that fixed us with manna for 40 years in the wilderness can do that. The same God that kept my clothes from being worn out and my shoes from being worn out. Can, come on, come on. They had a record of what God did. This is the importance. This is the importance. So guess what? If I know that God has done something for you and I'm going through it, guess who I'm going to come to? The person who has a record of what God can do. Very, very important. Very important. Very important. Okay? And so the faith is required of the eldership, not the sick. That's a very, very important thing. I hit that last week. Not that the person shouldn't, and and let me tell you why I said this. Well, I'm going to hit that. Let me not get ahead of myself, okay? And the elders pray over signifying a prone position. So my faith level ought to be at such a place that I know what God can do, okay? 
I like this. Make sure I didn't miss nothing because I'm sensing I wanted to say something that, um, that I don't want you to miss. Right? Yeah. See, see, the call is for elders, plural, not what? But I found that, I thought that was important. I thought that was important. Real quick. Remember in the Old Testament when God had sent the Israelites, they had just crossed the Jordan to fight. And y'all know the name Achan? Does anybody know that? There was one somebody in the camp that wasn't acting right. And they would go to war, and they would lose the war, and they couldn't figure out why. Because they had one, they were sitting in the camp, right? So you see the importance of the eldership being in alignment, right? Because there's a plurality that's implied and connoted there where God works. You can't, you, we, we can't limp and be effective. So our prayer should be mixed with faith, resulting in healing of the sick. And, and, and here's the three sub-things I want you to go, okay? So the prayer of faith is intended to raise the person up. Look at the text. 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 Okay? Very, very important. And, and I need to say this so you don't mess this up. Okay, let me go here real quick. It says in verse 14, if anyone is sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And then don't miss the next phrase. And the Lord will do what? Raise him up. And the Lord will do what? Everybody say that. And the Lord will do what? That's a very, very important thing that I wanted to point out there. So, so, so my faith, the faith of the eldership is not in my ability or our ability. Our faith and trust is in God. This is important. It's going to mess you up. It's very, very important. The faith is in God, right? And so the person who does the raising up is not the individual. It is God. Y'all didn't get this yet because a certain somebody comes to town doing a crusade or whatever, you're going to go to that somebody for healing as if that somebody's the one who does the healing. Because here's what's going to happen. God starts doing the miraculous for Robert, right? And then all of a sudden everybody want to come to me and you as if we got something. We ain't got none. You kind of get what I'm saying? We're just telling you what God can do. It's up to God to do what God said he's going to do, but Lionel, does this make sense? So your faith is never in people. Yeah. It's always where? Okay. And, and I love, I love, I love the text, God will raise them up. Now, I didn't do well with this last week. Let me hit this real quick. It says here, um, past sin sometimes can result in current illness because here's what that means, right? It says here, look at the text, look at the text. It says, and I'll make sure I, I do this well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. It says here that um, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, let me be clear. James is not saying that all sickness is the result of sin. Because here's what some of us do. We see a person going through something and we want to say, what did they do? That's not always the case. Come on, say amen. Okay? We live in a depraved world. Let me tell you what that means. The moment Adam and Eve sinned, they messed it up for everybody. Okay? So that mean my, my means my body is frail, and by default, my body is prone to death. So there's going to be some things that's going to happen within me by, by just nature of cells being corrupted, of things going wrong. There's just going to be places in me like when the weather changes, I catch a cold if I don't put on the right clothes. That does not mean that I sinned. God can heal those. Now, let me do say this. They are some sins that we do, that results in sickness. Can we be honest this morning? Come on now. There are some things like, like, and I don't want to offend anybody, but just let me just give you a picture here. Say, for example, we know smoking is bad for our health, and we keep doing it, and we get lung cancer. Don't blame nobody but yourself. 
We know there's sexually transmitted disease. Come on, let's, can we be honest this morning? And you go do some things, and you end up with the consequence of it. Don't brain, don't, don't talk about the devil. No, 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 no. You were the devil. Can we be honest this morning? Are you hearing me? Okay, I need to say that. I need to say that. I need to say that. And, and, and we've got to be okay with the sins and the sickness that we bring on ourselves as a result of the sin. That happens. The good news that I want you to hear me say this morning, whether you did it or whether nature did it, God can still fix our oh, Jesus. That's the good news that I bring to you this morning, that whether you did it, whether somebody else did it to you, whether nature did it, God can still fix it, and that's the point of the text. It doesn't matter, Jesus, I can't even get it out. It doesn't matter where you find yourself. The grace of God has provisions for your healing. He does. That's why I have to spend so, many, so much time on the eldership up front because the elders have to get it right because when you come, they can't blow it for God. Yeah. Can't mess it up. Can't mess it up. Can't mess it up. He can fix it, right? And, and look at what the text says. That's why I said the physical healing up front was very, very important. God can heal. God can fix it. That's important. Then once he fixes you, here's what he says. Now let me deal with the cause in the event it was sin. This is what I'm saying. Everybody in that church wasn't saved. Just like everybody in our church. Yeah. Right? If you're sick, the prayer of faith will save the one. God will raise him up if you committed sin. He will be what? He will be what? Here's what he says. God says this. Not only can I heal you physically, I can heal you spiritually as well. So come howsoever you need to come. You get it? I've got you, God says. I can deal with that physical thing. And when I get done with the physical thing, I'll deal with the spiritual man. Y'all don't believe me. Come on. When, when he met half the people, more than half of the people that he met in the Bible, watch the pattern. He never said before he healed, you saved. You know me. Are you following me? Matter of fact, more than two-thirds of them had no idea who he was. But when he dealt with the physical, they were open for the, I wish I had somebody. They were open for the spiritual. So lock into this, right? Imagine if you had an eldership or leadership that would go into folks' home that were sick and could pray and God could raise them up. And then they say, what you do? We didn't do nothing. God did. Who is he? I'm glad you asked. Yeah. Imagine that, right? There's the applications of that, that all of a sudden the church is so busy because the neighborhood, watch this, is calling the, I wish I had somebody in here, are calling the elders because they hear what's going down in Restoration Christian Fellowship. The power of prayer is happening. People are getting healed. Blind eyes are being opened up. The lame is being made to walk. The hunger is being fed. Miraculous are happening. Hey, call the elders over at that church. They seem to have it together. And when they show you got to be a member. Membership don't matter. Just call them. Just call them. Just call them. And watch what God does. Watch what God does. You kind of get the depth of the text now, right? Because if you feel, if, and I wish I had time to do the literary context of James. Here's what he's talking about. Those who were suffering, those who were being abused by their bad taskmaster. He's talking about a relief system that can be a blessing to people. You kind of get what I'm saying? So he's saying there's nothing wrong in the church that God can't fix. Be it physical, be it spiritual, be it so otherwise. The problem with us as believers, we don't really believe God for the physical, but we like the spiritual because that's subjective. But God is saying, no, no, I can do the real thing. 
Alcoholism, bring them. Drug addiction, bring them. Demon possession, bring them. Mental incapacity, bring them. It doesn't matter what the stronghold of uh, issue is. Bring them, okay? I'll heal them, then they'll develop a re- I wish I had somebody with me. <sighs> and and so, 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 healing is left to the will of God. Two more things. Then, so, we talked about that last week, right? So, you get it now? You get it now? I'm going to have a problem confessing to people I don't trust. I'm going to have a problem confessing to people with no record of the faithfulness of God. When I hire a lawyer in the event that I'm in trouble, let's assume I killed somebody. Here's what I'm asking the lawyer. Have you tried a murder case before? And if he says no, thank you for your service. I'm going to find somebody who has. And I move on to, have you tried a murder case before? And even if they say yes, my next question, were you the one that got OJ off? (laughs) I mean, I need a good lawyer. Amen, y'all. Come on, stay back. Come on back. (laughs) But my point is this. You want to know their track record. Imagine if we had a track record. Jesus. So then this is where this comes in, right? So he says, when exercise, the prayer of the righteous are powerful. Now it's going to make sense. Okay? So here's what James is saying in context. He's more than likely trying to encourage the congregation to exercise or work at their options of prayer more consistently. Here's what he says. I'll explain, I'll explain, and I'm done. I'll explain. Here's what he says. He says here, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person, and I love this translation, has great power as it is working. I don't like the King James, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. Okay, what does that mean? It says that when we live a life of prayer, And we put it into practice. And we become a house of prayer, a praying church. We cry out to God in prayer. And we have testimonies of the faithfulness of God. Here's Revelation. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the what? Words of their testimony. People are talking about God. People are hearing what God is doing. And God is having his way. As it is working, we won't be able to keep people out of this place for their press towards God. You got to get some things together. Does that make sense? We can't continue to take prayer lightly. There's power in that. There's healing in that. There's deliverance in that. When the, song, the songwriter said, there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. There's deliverance in the name of Jesus to break every chain. There's a storm rising. Can you, can, when it says all that, it's really saying, the effectual prayer of the righteous is powerful as it is working because how do I pray in the name of Jesus that God would do what God's going to do? Does this make sense? And God moves and God has his way. Restoration Christian Fellowship, I'm passionate about this. You've got to turn the corner. Our leadership, I was sharing with our leaders this morning, elders, we got to be so sold out to God that nothing takes the place of because of the people of God. We know we're called to the people of God. We're called to the people of God. So we sacrifice ourselves. We sacrifice our desires. We sacrifice our own stuff for the people of God. Because the church is a hospital. You get it? And they're going to come and the doctors need to be positioned to minister to the sick. Come on, stand to your feet this morning.